My name's Rob, and I am a producer. Um, yes, don't, don't applause. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there any other producers in the audience today? Because I want to point you out so that people know who to, who to stare at with dirty eyes. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I've been struggling with this theme of this talk for some months now. I mean, we talk, I put it up on, uh, on Facebook calling it, you know, a rocket science tips and tricks for a scalable pipeline. But trying to write down my thoughts in a cohesive, straightforward manner uh, that tends to distill my views into a simple linear progression of process has been very difficult. Um, I've rewritten this talk at least half a dozen times in attempting to do this, and I suspect that I've failed. Um, one thing that I've realized is that there's no simple answer to this. There's no right way when it comes to managing a complex series of tasks that includes multiple minds. Minds that are all trapped within their own established paradigms. We all live in worlds of our own creation. Uh, through experience, we build assumptions and take away from events those things that we feel matter to us. All I can do is try to explain my thoughts from my experiences and perspective and hope that in some way, what I think I know resonates with some of you and that can help change your paradigm even slightly. Uh, we are all trapped in our heads, but through interaction with other trapped minds, we do try to understand each other and understand what it is we do on a daily basis. Um, to be honest, this has been a very therapeutic experience for me in trying to try to write this down. Uh, it's, it's, I've tried to answer some big questions uh, that I sort of forgot. Um, why do we do this? You know, why are things done in a certain way? Um, is there a better way? Is it worth uh, the risk to find out? Um, there might be some controversy at the end of this talk. I hope so, and I really want to have some uh, open dialogue with you guys if there is any controversy. Um, but I, at the end of it, I probably will have very few answers. Um, but I hope I can at least help bring some questions to the forefront. Um, so to start with, one of my favorite um, TV shows growing up was a show called Cosmos. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember Carl Sagan. Billions of <laughs> he did a He quoted in one of the first episodes of Cosmos, um, he said, if, if, um, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. Um, which kind of like blew my mind as well. Wow, what the hell do you mean by that? <laughs> um, in this talk, what I'm going to try and do is explain to you my universe, how I got to my understanding of pipeline, um, so that when I show you a, um, a particular math formula that I have here, it'll sort of make sense to you. Um, so some of the things we're going to talk about, the stuff I want to talk about is, you know, what it is a producer, you know, why are we here, you know, some questions. An example of a process or two, um, some catchphrases, uh, some seemingly unconnected ideas, and uh, steps that will lead you to enlightenment. <laughs> here is, the, here is the, um, the equation that I was talking about just a moment ago. Um, this is the single most important thing in the talk. But it's going to take me a little while to get there to show you how simple this is. Um, <laughs> I know, it's, it's crazy. Isn't it? Maybe that'll make some of you stay. I don't know. Um, so, context is everything, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Understanding where you've come from um, and why you do what you do as a producer is very important um, in managing a team of people. I'm not just hiring a board artist, I'm not just hiring um, a layer artist, I'm not just hiring an animator. I'm hiring an artist who has experiences that are above and beyond the role in which I'm hiring for. And I want to make sure that there's a synchronicity within that. Talent is certainly a large part of it, but also, you know, do they have leadership skills to do the, do the lead job? Do they, um, do they have the right personality to get along with the crazy guy that I have down the corner that no one likes to work in his underwear? <laughs> um, you know, these things happen. It's true. Um, so, in order to give you a little bit of uh, context, I'm going to give you uh, just a little bit about me, but I'm not going to talk about all the stuff I've done work-wise, because that's boring. Um, here I am in 1969. I'm the, I'm the little kid in the, in the front, the little guy. Uh, you can't really tell in this picture, but I'm wearing my sneakers on the wrong feet and my shirts inside out. Um, my parents were really big on letting me kind of explore my own way of looking at the universe. Um, my mother was a beatnik artist before beatnik artists had a nickname. Um, my father was an engineer who quit university as an engineer and decided to become a farmer uh, and he could grow grass on a rock. 
My brother became an engineer and now as a hobby, he builds Tesla coils in his basement. Uh, my sister was always a hippie and still is, which you know I garner a lot of experience from. Uh, so I, I had a, a lot of interesting experiences growing up with this environment where I was allowed to just go off for hours on end in the middle of nowhere. We had nine acres of, uh, of land. There was no, no, nobody else around us. I, they would leave me for you know five, six hours a day um, and I would just come back bloodied and <laughs> you know. So you know, if we fast forward to 1980, uh, needless to say, I, I, I wasn't much into conformity. Uh, I'm still not. Um, I, I'm really a firm believer in questioning everything, um, let alone yourself, uh, everything else around you. Um, but I started working in, in film at the age of 16 um, because I thought school was stupid. Uh, and <laughs> it wasn't teaching me anything. Little did I know. Um, but my first real job that I had uh, at this, when I was at this age, was uh, working for uh, these guys. And little did I know then um, that this job was going to give me the fundamentals of experience that I was going to need to be a project manager, a manager of people. Uh, and you're like, what? McDonald's, really? Well, the first thing that I learned is um, the need for speed and accuracy. When you're making a burger, you need to be quick and make it look like something worth eating. Being fast isn't enough. So while you're working in a production, the faster and more accurate you can get at doing your job, the better your work will end up being. But doing it fast is not good enough. You have to do it fast and right. So you have to work on that, right? Troubleshooting. When someone, something goes wrong in the system and you don't have a lot of time to fix it, the food wagon needs to keep rolling along. How you handle that will be a testament to your courage and intestinal fortitude. A good way to advance is under pressure. Keep a level head and remember your training. You will get out alive. The same goes for any project you're on. Using your head to figure out how to get over a particular problem will make you a valuable part of any team. <clears throat> I like this one. Rapid changing priorities and how to deal effectively with them. Does any of that sound familiar? Sometimes it's in a job description when you go to apply it like DreamWorks. Um, you get into a groove and you know what to expect, even during lunch crush, then a busload of senior citizens, this actually happened, shows up and throws your entire pipeline out the window. The team hunkers down and helps uh, everyone get through the chaos. See, the thing was at, at McDonald's, if anybody makes a special order, just say I want to order a Big Mac with no pickles, that becomes a priority. You get a busload of senior citizens, every, every single one of them makes a special order. <laughs> so they all became priorities, which is kind of interesting. So no plan survives contact with the enemy. Roll with it and make sure that you're on top of what the most important priorities are at the time. Who is the person that's screaming the loudest in line? Get, make sure they get their burger first. Getting along with others. You end up working with some people that are, you really don't like. You can have a miserable time of it or find ways to A, get along, or B, go to management and find a solution that works for all. Get them fired, quit yourself. If you're management, knowing how to deal with a problematic personnel in situations is imperative. You've got to make sure people are playing together. And if they're not, deal with it right away. You can't let it fester. Paying attention to details. McDonald's has spent a lot of time and a lot of money creating a very detailed series of training programs on how to make the best burger. If you take the time to learn it <clears throat> and really pay attention to the details of what you are doing while making that burger, people will love you for it. This goes for any studio that you find yourself at. If they have straining, training programs, Use them to their fullest. If they don't have uh, training programs, find the time to sit down with the experienced people who understand the pipeline of that studio and learn from them. Don't wait to be asked. You have to go out and, and make this happen yourself. Attention to uh, the pipeline and how your role affects it. If you are part of the assembly line, you want to make sure that what you, what you are doing is going to help, not hinder. If I'm making a Big Mac, there's three people that are making a Big Mac. The guy who's making the burgers, the guy that's putting all the stuff on the buns, and the guy that's putting uh, the onions and then putting all the buns together. You've all got to be working in, as a team. Um, knowing what effect your job has on the ones coming before or after you will make you a solid part of any team. No one works in a bubble. Wow. All right. There we go. See, I'm a little nervous. I'm terrified of talking in front of people. I don't know if you've noticed or not. Um, so, roles. I think. Um, we could go on for hours about job descriptions, um, you know, board artists. I think, for the most part, I mean, I'm assuming that most of you are artists here, know how to draw and stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, we can, 
we can talk about job descriptions for board artists, layout artists, design, animation, all that. We all kind of know intrinsically after working in animation after you know a little while what those are. Um, but I guess the one job description that eludes me, I don't know about you guys, but is producer. You know, what, what is a producer? You know, what the hell does a producer do? <laughs> I think that's one of my favorite pictures. I went to a talk uh, at a Game Developers Conference a couple years ago, which you would think, you know, I work in animation, why would I go to a Game Developers Conference? But more on that later. Um, there was a two-day workshop uh, that was put together uh, for producers, by producers, to sort of talk about the, pr the process of producing. Um, I was really hungover for most of it, so it didn't really much of it to sink in. <laughs> so think about GDC, it's a lot of free booze. Um, but there was one producer at DreamWorks who said something that I, I thought really struck uh, a chord with me. And it's, you know, what the hell does a producer do? Well, all the jobs that no one else wants to do or has the time to do. Um, I think you could go to 20 different sites and come up with 20 different job descriptions about what a producer does. And just myself in this past three years, I've worked at two different studios, um, and my job description is radically different. Uh, working at Arc Productions, now working at DHX. You know, fundamentally, I'm a, I'm a manager of people and a manager of processes, but within that is a wide range of things that I have to be responsible for. But at the end of the day, I'm doing all the jobs that nobody else wants to do or has the time to do. Um, traditionally in animation, producers tend to come from two different backgrounds. And I say two because, you know, human, humans like to categorize things. We like to put things in boxes. There are obviously more backgrounds that people can come from, but two that, that really stick out to me. There's um, producers that come from a finance background, people that have, um, you know, worked their way through either the accounting process or understanding in great detail the funding process of, of how the money flows. Um, and then there are those that, uh, like myself, come through uh, the ranks, working their way up from uh, sweeping floors to, um, you know, eventually managing shows, hopefully with more than a couple of years in between, which, you know, sometimes is not the case, but whatever. Um, but what I find interesting um, about animation specifically, because I've spent the last few years trying to look at other industries and how other industries deal with project managers, because I don't like to use the word producers so much, because another great quote is, um, there are three jobs in history that you can excel at with little or no experience, um, and that's politician, prostitute, and producer. Um, <laughs> which I think is kind of funny. It, um, but I think to be a really good producer, you gotta have a little bit of the other two. Um, <laughs> kind of helps. Because you're always prostituting yourself, and politics always plays a role. But I find it interesting that through all of the technological innovations that we've seen take place through animation in the last, what, 100 years, 110 years of animation, there doesn't seem to be the same level of evolution in regards to workflow within these innovations. I mean, technology has been uh, prevalent in generating new ways of solving workflow challenges, like, like for instance, Shotgun, um, or other, other studios have used or developed other tools. But fundamentally, um, they're still moving tasks in the same way that they always have. Um, we tend to try to solve the immediate issues and how they affect our immediate workflow. Even tools like Shotgun or other software asset management tools are really only designed with this thought process in mind. They don't create a scalable pipeline even though they are considered a scalable piece of software. These are extremely important programs when used correctly. They help take, a, take away a ton of, of the guesswork. But if not used with the understanding of how to manage a project, they are only as useful as the user's knowledge, like anything else. These are tools that we use when we are in the world of task management. Uh, a set series of tasks that must be completed in order to move the ball forward. But I'm gonna, I'm kinda, I'm gonna get a little ahead of myself here. Um, one of the things that we learn in, in project management study is that there are three levels of uh, sort of looking at a challenge and task is the bottom level. The task is where you do the things. The other two levels are where Philosophically, what, it, what is it we're trying to do? How are we going to try and do it? And then we do it. Um, but we constantly live in the doing. And that's where we sort of lose the forest for the trees. So even with these new tools, we tend to default back to the management systems that were designed in the 50s for large manufacturing companies. What is known as the waterfall method of project management, but more on this later. 
The very nature of animation production, how we create content, has become so flexible, why are we still caught up in using outdated systems to manage these processes? So I ask myself, why do we do what we do? There's this company called the Standish Group. Um, they're a research think tank that specializes in group reflection for business. Um, they ask the hard questions that the businesses don't want to ask themselves. The art and science of harnessing deep knowledge. I kind of wish I could work for them. It'd be kind of fun. They try and help organizations develop a better understanding of how to leverage both the tech in their industry and the knowledge base that is already there. They did a research paper a few years ago to study some of the fundamental reasons why projects fail. This research was done for a wide variety of manufacturing processes, from bridge building to software development to film productions. They found that on an average, 60% of all projects are considered a failure. That's kind of a sobering number, isn't it? So why are so many projects a failure? Here are some catchphrases that we can sort of try and go, go backwards a little bit to try and look at the human condition, um, the paradigm, uh, or, or how our brains work. Because I think that is a very fundamental reason as to why projects fail. Um, and this is going to be kind of almost like, what's that movie where you keep going backwards into dream? Um, it's a really awful film. Either. Somebody knows, somebody can shut it out if they want. Um, so here are some, um, these are some theoretical catchphrases, if you will, that project managers have put together uh, who are way smarter than me and have university degrees and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the first one is one that we, we deal with a lot um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's not what you think. Um, student syndrome doesn't mean that it only happens to students, um, or what I like to call is the road to hell. Um, if we only had a little bit more time, think how much better that project or that shot or that design could be. Just need an extra day, just one more day. I can make it this little bit, and oh shit, no, I missed my deadline. Well, that's all right, it'll only be like just half a more day, just half a more day, oh, I missed, oh shit. And it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, which leads into scope creep. Scope creep, which is, uh, is a term that's used in software a lot. We don't use it as much in animation, um, but you know, they also call it feature creep. This phenomenon can occur when the scope of a project is not properly defined, documented, or controlled. How many characters are we going to have in this show? Um, what's the character density on a per shot basis? These are all kind of boring things that you know, some project managers will talk to you about, but they kind of do make an effect. Like if, if you assume four characters per shot on an average of an 11-minute show and you get a storyboard back and there's 12 characters per shot, well, you've just tripled the amount of work um, that somebody has to do. Um, and it wasn't budgeted with that in mind. But again, more on that later. Um, this one's my favorite. This is the one that we fall into, I think, on every single project I ever worked on. Parkinson's Law. The busy trap. If you, I don't know if you can read that. Uh, yeah, you can. Okay. Work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. This tends to, f to creep into larger projects where there's a lot of people involved. A schedule is created for a department, and those in the department consciously or subconsciously make sure that the work done uh, fills the time allotted, even if it could be done faster. So, you know, you work on a schedule, you say, well, we've got, you know, four days to do this. I'm like, great, I've got four days. Um, well, you, when you really look at the thing, you, you could probably get it done in three, but there's no incentive for you to get it done in three because you just were told that you had four days. So you're going to take four days. But then when the fourth day comes along, student syndrome sets in. And, and so on. <laughs> this guy, is, he's kind of funny. Peter Principle, this is an actual thing. We always thought it was a bit of a joke, right? This guy, I mean, he, he, wrote, he wrote this back in the 50s. And this is the chap who wrote it. Um, Lawrence J. Peter is his name. I think that was the cover of um, Time magazine. It was originally written as a comedy, a comedic thing, but uh, a bunch of researchers actually got together and, um, and decided, you know, yeah, this is an actual phenomena. Um, Competent workers are rewarded through promotion until they reach a position in which they are no longer effective. Um, we use this very derogatory um, a lot. And it, nine times out of ten, it's really not the fault of the individual. It's the fault of the system. We, we, we reward success with promotion. We don't necessarily look at the underlying or underpinning reasons why that individual or that system was successful. We just simply gut reaction, reward success with promotion. 
to the point where the person who was awarded with a, a higher paying position or more responsibility really didn't have the psychological capability of, to do that job. So it's, it's not necessarily their fault that um, they're in over their head, but the Peter Principle still exists. Uh, Hofstadler's Law, this is my favorite actually. They're all my favorite. But um, <clears throat> it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstadler's Law. <laughs> I like that. The more complex the set of processes, the more difficult it becomes to predict the amount of time it will take to complete the task. So, you know, we spend a lot of time in Excel making these schedules and, and you know, these, this waterfall, you know, tasks that are going to happen like this and this and this. And we think that we're putting in Hofstadler's Law, but we kind of are putting in Hofstadler's Law, but we're not taking into account Hofstadler's Law, which I think is kind of, kind of funny, really. Uh, social inertia. This happens a lot, um, especially with old farts like myself. Uh, being resistant to change or being caught up in how it has always been done. Um, there was, a, I can't remember, uh, Rodriguez, uh, the filmmaker, when he was doing El Mariachi. And he, you know, he made that film for like, what, five grand? Uh, he couldn't get anybody in Hollywood to sort of back his film because that's not how you make films in Hollywood. Uh, and he called that the both ends of the hands syndrome in the, in the sense that um, Thanksgiving, his mother would always make a ham, boil a ham, and she had this huge pot, and she would cut the ends off the ham and stick it in the pot. And he, he asked her one day, he says, you know, like, why do you cut the ends off the ham? Because the ham's big enough to fit in the pot. She goes, well, that's, that's the recipe. That's how, that's how your grandmother cooked it. And she went to, he went to see his grandmother and asked her, he says, like, what's the point of cutting the ends off the ham? Like, like what's part, how does that make the ham taste better? And she goes, well, the only reason why I did that is because it didn't fit in the pot. So, you know, time management. Time management is something that we all have to deal with, and it's, it's often considered a necessary because one, available time is limited. Um, two, time cannot be stored. If unused, it is lost forever. Three, one's goals are usually multiple, sometimes conflict, and not all goals are of equal priority. And four, goals cannot be accomplished without the application of effort, which requires the use of time. So knowing when, when and where to spend your time, um, taking into consideration Parkinson's law and Hostetler's law, and of course, Murphy's law, because anything that can go wrong will go wrong. What all of the laws have in common are us. The psychology of what we do and why we do it is arguably the single biggest reason for success or failure of any project. I think that it is important to look outside of our industry for ideas and innovation uh, of what we do within our industry. Animation is no exception to that. I know that we spend a lot of time honing our skills to do our job to what we feel is the best of our ability, be it animate, edit, or produce, or anything in between. We go to school to learn. We spend a large part of our daily life living and breathing film in some form or other. We are wired to look for information that we feel is relatable, re relevant, um, for what we like and what we do. In so doing, we can easily ignore information that may seem to be outside of our interests. This is called confirmation bias. Which brings me to something that many of us um, may not think is important to being a producer, but is understanding human behavior or psychology. <clears throat> now, I'm not suggesting you uh, go and take some psych courses. Um, Wikipedia works. Because, um, you know, anything, that, anything that's really good, um, a little bit of information is dangerous. So it's really, worth, uh, really worthwhile doing that. Um, Last year, as part of my slow attempt to get my project management professional certificate, certificate which is kind of this stupid green card that you can, I can work in any industry if I want, not just cartoons, although I don't know why I wouldn't. Um, there was this guy doing this workshop <clears throat> who asked a question at the start, and he's a project manager, he's been a project manager for 40 years, worked for pla places like Toyota, NASA, um, you name it. Um, what do you consider to be the most important component in a successful project? And this is a room filled with project managers. It could have been filled with anyone. Um, and I answered with what I felt was the right answer, was, you know, your team. Your team is the most important thing. You know, getting them, and he said, wrong. And he walked along, and he, he asked. He asked some more people. Um, the answer, he said, is you. You are the most important part of the project. And what he meant by that was that you are the most important part of a scalable project. Not 
the process, not the person who's telling you what to do, but you as the individual, the skills that you bring to, to your job. Because understanding that puts you in a better place to work holistically within the team. Uh, some more psychology, because you know psychology is fun, and I like this guy's glasses. Um, Kurt Lewin was a German psychologist who many consider to be the father of social science. He came up with three main styles of leadership that can apply to any management process or position. And any of you here who are artists but are also leaders of artists um, may want to think about this. And uh, I should say that I'm not looking to try and get you guys to manipulate people. Um, <laughs> I mean, sadly, that's what we do as producers, is manipulate outcomes. You know, we're given a budget and we're given a schedule and we try and make people think it's their idea that they're actually going to meet, meet the deadline. But, you know, you, you have to do it in such a way that it becomes their idea, right? So with these um, management styles, uh, thinking about them, uh, they all work and it really depends on the people that you're working with as to how you want to do them. There's the authoritarian, or autocratic. Um, this style is used when leaders tell their employees what, they, what uh, they want done and how they want it accomplished without getting the advice of their followers. Some of the appropriate conditions to use this in would be um, the so if, if uh, you have a very short period of time to solve a problem um, and you have well-motivated employees. It's like, you know, we've got like, you know, we've got, we got crunch time, we've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, blah, 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 you know, move on. Um, we have the participative, or the democratic, which is, I think, my favorite. This style involves the leader including one or more employees in the decision-making process, determining what to do and how to do it. However, the leader maintains the final decision. Uh, using this style is not a sign of weakness, but rather is a sign of strength that your employees will respect, supposedly. Uh, this is normally used when you have um, part of the information and your employees have the other parts. So you, as the, as the manager of the, of the team, may not be you know, you may not understand how long it takes to actually animate something on twos or how long it takes to composite that shot. So you're relying on the experience of your team leaders or, or you know, your, your, your senior artists within that process to sort of give you the feedback and then you sort of buy into it uh, collectively, if you will. This one really works um, well within a game environment. I don't know if any of you guys work in games at all, sort of software development, game, game development. When, this is more like you don't really know what the road map is. You don't know where you're going with the thing. Um, in this case, you're, the, the leader is allowing the employees to make the decisions. Google does this a lot, um, even to the point where they have like one day a month where Google employees just do whatever the hell they want for that day. It's like, you know, come up with something. Just you, you have 12 hours. You have to do something, but it doesn't have to be work-related. Um, um, this, this one's a lot of fun, but it's, it's hard to put this one into a deadline-driven animation pipeline. But there are moments where it can be used, especially in design, uh, or when, when you're doing a, a sort of like a roundtable script discussions and stuff like that. You can have a lot of, a lot of fun with that. Um, but all of these theories are derived from something even deeper, believe it or not. Oh, here, I like that one. That's, that gives you a... Um, sort of a, an idea as to how the stuff is broken down. Deeper, but I mean by, what I mean by deeper is we are wired to view the world in a particular way. Um, and our brains, no matter culturally, and it goes beyond culture, it, it has nothing to do with culture, it's just it's how our brains perceive the world around us. Um, and again, a whole lot of really smart people came up with these uh, these uh, particular terms, um, and you'll 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 recognize as I as I explain the terms, you'll recognize things that have probably even happened to you today, uh, either yourself or with somebody that you uh, that you've been dealing with. Correspondence bias is is an interesting one. This happens a lot with emails. Um, <clears throat> correspondence bias, are also known as fundamental attribution error is the tendency for people to overemphasize personality-based explanations or behaviors observed in others. So in other words, when you're reading an email from someone, you're not, you're not reading it with their context. You're reading it with what you think is their context, but actually the context is coming from you. And so you might get pissed off because, well, you, 
you just sent me an email, you're an asshole. It's like, well, I'm just asking a question. Did that happen to anybody today? <laughs> yeah, certainly happened to me. Um, confirmation bias. Yes, there's nothing so absurd that it cannot be believed as truth if repeated often enough. This is the tendency to search for or interpret information in a way that conf confirms one's preconceptions. In addition, individuals may discredit information that does not support their views. Um, I think if you have a leader that um, falls into this on a regular basis, um, it can be really, really challenging uh, to finish your work. Uh, you see this a lot. I mean, I don't know if you saw the um, Bill Nye, the science guy debate. Uh, there was an awful lot of confirmation bias going on in, uh, in that. <laughs> arguably from both sides, arguably from both sides. Uh, I'm not going to take uh, one side over the other because, you know, Bill Nye was right. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Self-serving bias. This is the tendency to claim more responsibility for the successes than the failures. You know, it may also manifest itself as a tendency for people to evaluate ambiguous information in a way beneficial to their interests. So, a project fails, or, you know, somebody gets the knife in the back. Nobody, nobody really, you, know, you, you talk about the, um, the post-mortems, but self-serving bias uh, plays a huge role, as well as confirmation bias, as to how we actually perceive that post-mortem. If we don't have that in, the, in our heads, we'll, we'll never really see what the mistakes are, or at least own up to them. Um, and I'm as a victim of, to that as anybody else. Uh, framing. Framing is a fun one. Welcome to fail. Population you. <laughs> framing is an odd one. I mean, it, it's, it's, um, framing can be considered propaganda. Framing can be, you know, looking at a problem from a slightly different angle. Um, when I was in college, I was going to do this experiment tonight, but I sort of let the cat out of the bag now. I, um, I, we did, a, we did a, a course, which I can't remember the name of it now, but it was essentially about propaganda and media studies, uh, and framing was a big part of it, go figure. Um, and the guy doing the course, he, the first day he showed up, he had this cute little teddy bear that he took out of his suitcase and he put it on the, on the table in front of him. And he said, this is Henry, my teddy bear. I take him everywhere I go. Uh, I love him. I, I sleep with him. I, I've had him for years. He's, he's, he's really special to me. And then he went on and he talked for like 10 minutes or so, and every once in a while he, you know, he'd bring Henry into the conversation. And then, um, and then out of the blue, he just went and threw Henry on the floor. And half the audience went, what the hell are you doing? What are you, it's Henry. He goes, it's just a stupid teddy bear. But I got you to believe otherwise, didn't I? I mean, that's framing um, at its extreme. Uh, using a, a too narrow approach or description of the situation in order to, uh, to sort of frame an issue. Um, framing can be used uh, as well to try and look at a problem uh, from a different perspective. I think I was talking with somebody earlier. There's the triangle. You know, why is it, you know, make it, do it faster, cheaper, why does it look like crap? But, you know, the, the real, it's, it's really called scope, resource, and time. But, you know, we like to derog make a derogatory thing out of it. But the, framing, but the framing of that is what we're used to is do it faster, cheaper, why does it look like crap? But y you can reframe that to be you know, scope, resource, time, it's like, well, okay, I may not have enough time. That doesn't mean I have to make it look like crap. It just means I have to change my scope, change the, uh, change the, um, uh, what's important. You know, how do you, how do you reframe what's important in that shot or in that episode so that you can get it done on time and still make everybody happy? Sure, it's not going to be the $10 million show that you thought it was going to be, but, you know, does it still get the point across? Does, does somebody laugh? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to look like crap. Um, it's probably the most difficult one to find an answer for, a simple answer for, which I think is ironic. Um, and then we have um, hindsight bias, which is, um, you know, those really were the droids I was looking for. Um, sometimes called the I knew it all along effect is the inclination to see past events as being predictable. Um, again, that sort of bleeds into the confirmation bias. And, and our default position is to never be wrong. So our brains, our psyche tries to find reasons for things to have, ha have happened. Well, they, maybe they were just wrong. And you just have to learn from it. Um, 
There's also functional fixedness, which is an odd one. Um, and this, I've, I've, I think I've mentioned this to some people before over many, many beers. Um, this, is a, this is a fun one. This is a test that was done in the, in the 50s. I thought it was earlier than that. Um, the um, test subjects were given um, a box with thumbtacks, a box of matches, and a candle. And they were asked to uh, mount the candle on the wall uh, without wax dripping onto the table. Um, and it took subjects a very long time to um, achieve this simple task because they were being given a task. They weren't being given a problem, per se. The way it was being worded, it was a task. The task was mount the candle, don't let wax drop. They didn't see the box as part of the, part of the solution to the problem because the box was the container that held all the tax. Other test subjects were given the exact same problem with the box as a separate um, item. The tax were on the table, the box, and they were given the same set of uh, criteria and they immediately did exactly what you see here. So they tacked the box to the wall. And it's, an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon called functional fixedness. Another example is um, uh, two, uh, two ropes hanging in a, in a room, and your task is to hold both ends. Um, but it's purposely designed that you can't, they're too far apart. You, can't hold, you have to be holding one in order to get the other one. But they're too far apart for you to be able to actually do it. But in the room, is also a pair of pliers on a table. Most subjects saw the pair of pliers as simply that, a pair of pliers. They didn't see it as something else, as a tool that could be used to put on the end of the rope, start the rope swinging, grab one rope, then grab the other one as it swings towards you. Give it weight. It was simply a pair of pliers, functional fixedness. We see it happen a lot on a more complex level within the software that we use. Um, be it Flash, Toon Boom, Storyboard Pro. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in the specific fun function that we perceive that software to be. And we may sometimes be put into a situation, especially small studios, where you have to have you know, um, uh, very versatile individuals that are doing more than one process. Um, you know, you kind of have to look at that tool as something more than just the hammer. Um, is it also a paperweight? Um, you know, can I open a door with it? Um, but you know, can, can you look at Flash as being something more than just a symbol-based sort of piece of software? What else can Flash do for me in order, uh, in order to, to finish this process? Um, these biases play a significant role in how we deal with creating and maintaining a pipeline. From writer to the editor, these biases can play a role in how we do our jobs. As a team leader, it is worthwhile being aware of these in everyone that you work with as well as yourself. I'm not suggesting that you manipulate people, but have an understanding as to how someone may have come to their conclusion, and that may help you in communicating with them on how to adjust their conclusion, or yours for that matter. Um, so, oh, here's some, uh, here's the boring part. I like the brain stuff, because, you know, it's kind of fun to, go into what we think about. But <clears throat> these are some catchphrases that you may or may not have heard of. Waterfall, agile, critical chain, extreme project management, which is crazy. I don't, I, I don't know why I put that there because <laughs> it's just extreme. Waterfall is what we deal with on a daily basis in animation. Series of tasks that move a process from one phase to the next. We've all seen a schedule, <laughs> right? We've all seen what, can, what Excel can do for us. What Excel can't do for us is um, allow us to finish a project on time. All it can do is give us pretty colors and tell us that, oh, we have to have our revisions done before we can start character builds. We've got to, uh, we've got to have our board, board pulls done before we can start revisions. When in reality, we all know that's bull because it isn't a series of ones and zeros. It's not on and off. There's more to it than that. Um, Agile is something that came out of the software industry. Uh, it's not an easy concept to introduce in an animation pipeline. Um,
but there are some elements to it that I think uh, can be relevant within, uh, within the cycles of uh, various processes. Um, for instance, when it comes to story writing and story, uh, storyboarding, um, the agile mentality is uh, worth looking at. Um, it's, it's, it's already kind of a ma an agile sort of mindset anyway. You do outline, first draft, polish, thumbs, clean, to a certain degree design gets tossed into that, but it's an iterative process. So the idea with Agile is you don't know what the end product is going to be, but you want to try and um, get a prototype together. So I'm going to put a rough draft. I'm going, to, I'm going to put an outline together. I don't know what the, I don't know how many pages the script's going to be at the end of this, but I kind of know what my story is, so here's what I'm putting across. And then you, you, know, you, you sit down with the director and the broadcaster, and you, you guys, you, you sort of hammer it out, and you're like, okay, I'm going to go back and do a first draft. So you're now, you've just iterated. You've, you've now created more functionality to that script. And the same thing happens with storyboards. I mean, if you're lucky enough to be in a process where you know, it's a collaborative environment where your storyboard artists and your directors are doing uh, thumbnails and pitches, um, you know, the, the, it can be a really a rewarding and, and, uh, and fun experience to have sort of this, this iterative process. You know, not really knowing, you, you kind of have an idea now that we have a script, but you know, as, as a story artist, you're bringing something more to the table than what the scriptwriter could. Um, and, and now you may even have some ideas as far as design, um, how that's going to uh, affect uh, what happens next. So that's kind of the agile, is to trying to, trying to fail fast. And because fail is not a bad word. Fail is something that we do every day, something that we learn from. We did it in school. I mean, in, in Britain, they called it revisions. They didn't call it homework. Harry Potter, you know. Anybody watch Harry Potter? I'm doing revisions tonight. Um, so the idea of, of Agile is to try and, try and to create a circular effect quickly so that you can solve the problems, the big problems, faster and earlier. <clears throat> we also have Scrum, which is fun. Um, this one, I, I, again, is more of an, uh, it works with Agile, and it's, the idea is you're splitting up small teams um, and making them autonomous. So like, you know, you guys are going to uh, work on this functionality for this part of the, of the, of the space shuttle. Um, go to it. And then, you know, you get a small team of guys that are like, oh, okay, well, we have to do this. So again, doesn't really work well for animation unless, uh, unless you are thinking of an animation department where um, in a studio, in a studio environment, you may have you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 animators working on the same series, um, but they might be working on four different shows at the same time. So while they're doing the same task, they're not doing the same uh, shot. Um, they're learning, they need to be able to learn from each other. They need to be able to learn from the mistakes uh, that others have made as well as the successes. So the scrum, the idea of the scrum is to have these short little meetings, no more than 15 minutes in the mornings, and if, it, if your project's in trouble, you do these more frequently, and if the project's in good shape, you do them less frequently. But just to get an idea of, of um, what are the big ticket items that everybody has to deal with today, okay, well, we, we definitely don't want to have the characters animating with their tongue hanging out, uh, that, uh, the client doesn't like that. Okay, well, let's make sure that doesn't happen again. Because even though you're all working on the same show, it's very easy for that information to sort of get lost, because email is where information goes to die. It is, uh, it is the smoking gun, not the trigger. Um, and, you know, don't forget, it's the war room. There's no fighting uh, in, the scrum, in the scrum room. Oh, look at that. We're getting close to uh, knowing what this is. I can give you a little hint. Buffer. You remember, you remember we looked at that schedule? Um, oh, here we are. This, uh, this thing? Sorry, I'm going to go back here. Um, there are buffers in here. Buffers are, you know, the amount of time that could be allocated to that job if it was needed. Because um, to do the revisions, you know, there might only, you might only really need three days, but we put five in there just in case. Uh, to do the character do, uh, builds, we put in three weeks, but you might actually be able to get it done in two. Um, but the buffer is kind of hidden within, within the schedule. The amount of time that it takes you to do something, because it's not every show is going to be exactly the same. You don't know when you're making the schedule. Is there going to be 40 characters every episode? Is there only going to be two? 
You know, how long, what does that three weeks really represent? Um, we don't know, so let's add a buffer. Um, but the buffers, when you build them inherently into the schedule like this, they get eaten up because of Parkinson's principle. Because the amount of time that you have to do something is directly proportional to the amount of time that you think you have to do it in. So the buffer is equal to two different numbers, which we'll get to, which is what is known as the critical chain or theory of constraints. And this was a, um, a theoretical physicist who got bored with doing theoretical physics and decided to go into project management and decided to help uh, companies um, stop failing. Um, remember that 60% number? So he was looking at you know, how we do the waterfall process, which was made for the Ford Motor Company in order to put out more cars uh, in a more efficient manner. The problem with a waterfall is anytime you decide to change any one of these things, it throws everything out of whack and costs you buckets of money. Because now all of a sudden, you, you no longer have um, the ability to be agile in what your people do. Because you've hired a whole bunch of people to do very specific things. He wanted to look at it more like a um, Swiss Army knife sort of approach. Uh, and not allow inertia to fall into, uh, into the equation. So. In a conventional project schedule, you got job one, you got job two, you got job three, you got job four, and those buffers are hidden within each of those processes. In a critical chain process, your buffers are separated and made explicit. So the schedule is still the same as far as the length of time that you have to do something, but what you're, what you're now doing is, what, what you're now trying to do is create two different um, sets of numbers. There is the aggressive but possible, and then the highly probable. And then you can have your buffer that shows up at the end of that. So aggressive but possible, highly probable, and your buffer. In this approach, our low or aggressive but possible is the estimate, is, is, the, is the most likely estimate of time that the task will take. The high or highly probable estimate is the conservative estimate that takes into account possible problems. By way of example, let's say I live 15 minutes uh, away from work. On a good day, I know that my aggressive but possible estimate for getting into work is 15 minutes. But what if there's bad traffic, construction, an accident, I blow a tire? I know the route and alternate routes well enough that I feel confident giving whatever the conditions that I can make it to work in 30 minutes. This becomes the highly probable number. Sometimes uh, coming up with that estimate requires either a very, a very large amount of confidence, knowledge, um, or guess. On a task of a high variability or unknown elements, the spread between the low, the aggressive but possible, and the high, highly probable, can be quite large. So what this, uh, what this formula is, is you're highly probable, subtracting your aggressive but possible, the number you come up with is your buffer. So if you always take that into consideration on a schedule, we know we can do 30 seconds of animation a week. Um, it's highly probable we're only going to get 12 seconds done because of this or that or the other thing, um, which means our buffer is 18 seconds per week. But you then take those buffers. You don't put it inside the animation part like you did in the waterfall. You take your buffers for each of those tasks, the critical chain being all the tasks that can't be done until the next thing is done. Anything else can be slid in between. So your critical chain is not you know, um, A to B. It may be like, uh, or A to Z, I should say. It might, it might be more like A to F, and then um, Z, uh, K to Z or whatever. Like there's some things in an animation production that can happen that is not relying on other things. Like you can do sound design without um, final picture, for instance. Um, you can do um, you can do character design without final script. Not advisable, but can be done. So what you do is you take all these buffers and you put them all together at the end. You know all the tasks that are reliant on each other get their own sort of sets of buffers. And that becomes your hopper, if you will. And it's, it goes for the money as well as, uh, as well as your time. 
And what you then do is you covet that, that, that buffer. You say like, okay guys, we've got you know, two weeks. We've got two weeks to do, uh, to do the, the, the design on this episode. Uh, but you come across an episode that was wildly outside of your scope and it's actually taking you three weeks. So say, okay, well we've used a week of our buffer time. But luckily we've got six weeks of buffer. So what we need to do is now look at that and not, you publicly announce the fact that you just used a week of your buffer time. And it's like, okay guys, we just used a week. How do we, how do we avoid doing that again? Is it uh, reducing the number of characters? Is it reducing complexity? Is it adding more time to, the, to that process? Was our buffer uh, idea wrong? If you continually do this and do it using, uh, ooh, yes, a true Jedi master. He always knows where the, uh, the uh, toilet is. The other half of the critical chain is the, five, is the theory of constraints or the five steps because inertia is something that is, um, is what we all want to default to. You know, once you figure it's like, okay, I know what's going on in this process, so it's all running smooth and everything's fine, and I'm just gonna, oh, look at YouTube, and I'm gonna drink coffee, and I'm gonna drink beer, and oh shit, we're behind schedule. What the hell happened? Um, it's because inertia set in. You didn't constantly look at the problem. You didn't constantly ask yourself, what is the constraint right now that's causing um, the system to not move forward? You know, how do we elevate that constraint? How do we exploit it? How do we get rid of it? Is it something that we have to accept? Is it a constraint that's going to stay there? In which case, it's no longer a constraint, but it is now the, it is now the, um, the linchpin that all the other constraints have to follow. Um, we have no more money? Okay, well that is a constraint that we have to live with. How do we deal with that? How do we then subordinate everything else to that constraint? How do we then elevate the performance to that constraint? How do we repeat this process? Never allow inertia to sit in. Never ever allow inertia to sit in. Nothing is ever over. Um, so, does that make any sense? I hope. Um, so how do, we, uh, how do we create a scalable pipeline? Well, you can't do it alone, of course, unless you are. There's an awful lot of people that are making their own little films. But, I mean, they all have their own little deadlines that they're constantly missing as well. Um, but the nice thing about your own deadline is that it doesn't matter um, because you've decided it doesn't. <clears throat> you are important to the process. Take ownership of that. There is more to cartoons than just cartoons. Look outside your bubble. Pay attention to what is going on around you. Don't fall into the inertia trap or any of the other mind traps that our wonderful little brains have built over the millennia. Be vigilant. This is hard, so it is worth doing. Just because that is the way it was done before doesn't mean it's the best way. That being said, don't allow confirmation bias to color your view. You are not always right, and be big enough to know when you are not. I can't wait to have arguments with anybody here afterwards. On a large scale project, separate out your buffer time. Be vocal about it, protect it, make people know that it's there and it's a big deal to use. There better be good reasons. <clears throat> if you see, using these focusing steps, issues cropping up that can be avoided, deal with them immediately. You don't have to be a jerk about it, but you need to be honest. With you, with yourself, and with those that you're dealing with. And there is no holy grail. Even with all these processes in mind, there's 60% of projects that still fail. But all you can do is the best you possibly can to try and avoid that. Um, so, just in closing, I have a couple of quotes. I'm not going to read all 100. I put, it's, um, this guy, uh, he was a uh, project manager for NASA uh, for 40 some odd years. So he kind of knows a little thing about making rockets and dealing with rocket scientists. But there's a few in here that I thought are still relevant to animation. Um, rule number three, management principles still are the same. It is just that the tools have changed. You, you still find the right people to do the work and get out of the way so that they can do it. Rule number six, a comfortable project manager is one waiting for his next assignment or one on the verge of failure. Security is not normal to project management. Rule number 12, don't get too e egotistical so that you can't change your position, especially if your personnel tell you that you are wrong. You should cultivate an attitude on the project where your personnel, personnel know that they can tell you when you've made wrong decisions. Rule number 14, most managers succeed on the strength and skill, skill of their staff. Rule 15, the seeds of problems are laid down early. 
Initial planning is the most vital part of a project. The review of most failed projects or project problems indicate the disasters were well planned to happen from the start. Rule number 23, the source of most problems is people, but damned if they'll omit it. Know the people working on your project to know what the real weak spots are and the real strengths. Uh, rule 28, people who monitor work and don't help it get done never seem to know exactly what is going on. Being involved is the key to excellence. Yes, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Rule 33, I need to report on my desk by five, just so you know. That, oh, sorry, I was my boss. Um, if you have a problem that requires additional people to solve, you should approach putting people on like a cook who, was under, who has undersalted the food. I really like that one. It's not about just throwing bodies at, uh, at a problem, right? Managers who rely only on paperwork to do the reporting of activities are known failures. Guys. And, my, and the last one, which I think, uh, wrong decisions made early can be recovered from. Right decisions made late cannot correct them. There we are. Any questions? Any arguments? <laughs> uh -huh. Anybody want any questions? No? No questions? Oh, you, okay. So a question about the two project management schedules. Yes. The uh, traditional and the uh, CCPM. Yes. Is there any reason that you would keep one from the client and one that just remains internal? Yes. Do they, do they need to see both? Well, especially, especially in, in um, I think especially when, you, when you're dealing with financing and you're dealing with CMF and, and things like that because, I mean, for, uh, and this is, this is the part of the challenge of trying to come up with, um, with sort of the critical chain sort of buffer management system within, within sort of the traditional animation process is that we deal a lot with labor tax credits. And so if there's no labor attached to the money, um, then how do you get the funding for that? But the thing is, like, even with that buffer um, indicated, a budget and a schedule are simply a set of assumptions. They have no basis in reality. They only, they only become real once they've happened. So if you can present uh, your budget and your schedule and your numbers with that in mind to whoever it is you're getting financing from, and you, you show, you know, yes, this is, this is our buffer, but it's, it's the same buffer that we would have. I'm just showing it in a different way. However you want to sort of reframe that challenge. Uh, it's still a set of numbers that are strictly attached to a series of assumptions that you hope is either not going to happen or, or is going to happen. So, I mean, there are ways to, to do it. It's just, it's a bit more, it's a bit more of a paradigm shift because everybody's used the telefilm budget. Everybody's used the Excel. I go into, I don't know, half a dozen different studios and they're still using the exact same Excel format that I saw 20 years ago. And I'm like, what? Well, like, aren't we using like Excel 11 now? Why are we still using this bullshit piece of it? <laughs> Stupid. Moronic. Any other questions? Uh, about the like 60% of projects failing, like how do you quantify like if something was a success or a failure? Like the, the Standish group, what they did is they qualified, the, uh, they, they did three qualifications. A success, it was, there, was, there was specific criteria that was put in place for what was considered to be a success what was considered to be a challenge. and what, what, Failed projects were ones that never completed. So for 2009, 24% of the, the 8,000 projects they looked at never completed. 44% in 2009 were ones that either went over budget or over schedule in some form or other. Uh, the successful ones were the ones that stayed within the assumptions, within the paradigm that was originally established for that produ production to be as considered a success. So it was on budget and on time. If it went over budget or over time, for whatever reason, it was considered a challenge uh, or a failure. But for the most part, the failures were like, yeah, we just didn't finish it. Yeah, that bridge didn't get built. Sorry, we screwed up. <laughs> that building fell down. <laughs> <laughs> that rocket blew up. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, just a question about gathering all the buffer time into like one separate thing. If you let the know, if you let the team know we have X amount of weeks of buffer time, does that, in certain tasks, cause people like, 
Well, I can probably fall into inertia a little bit because we have- Only if you allow Parkinson's uh, law to, to take into effect. Okay, so it's just basically you have to stay on top of it. Yeah. But would withholding the specific number cause the same problem because people will assume there's a buffer or? Um, I think that's, that's a systemic problem in our industry is that um, there are so many productions that have gone through that process of hiding the buffers that, and so many projects that have gone over schedule and still completed that it's now considered to be kind of the norm. Like I can't tell you how many times I've worked on shows where I've heard it's like, ah, yeah, they only tell us we got a week, but I'm sure we got more. Eh, fine, it's fine, don't worry about it. Hey, wait, but that deadline wistfully as it passes me by. So it's and basically it's, just like, you have, just have to try and breed a culture where like spending buffer time is a negative thing. And yeah. Just trying to yeah. get your team. Which is, you know, it, it, I don't, I don't, it's a challenge. Yeah. Trying, trying to get people to think that way is a challenge for sure. Because, I mean, there are some systemic thoughts and processes that, because they've always been done that way, right? Inertia, inertia is a very hard thing to, to, to overcome. Yeah. And is there any incentive if the buffer time doesn't get used up? Well, that's really up to, to the crew. Yeah, I mean, that's really up to the um, up to the people with the money, right? There's always there's always ways to create incentive for sure. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of like you know, we've scheduled you know an extra six weeks for a particular thing to to take place, and if we're actually you know if we don't end up using those six weeks, then I think everybody should share in that success. And it should be the, uh, the individuals that were on that team as well as the company. Um, I've worked on shows where we've done that, uh, where you know, it, uh, it's um, kind of a profit share sort of thing. It's very, very rare, uh, extremely rare. Um, but I don't think, if you do this right, I don't, I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't do that. Um, because everybody, when everybody has an investment, either psychologically or financially or whatever, time-wise, into, into a process, um, they feel more a part of it, more connected. It's not just a job, right? Um, but as soon as, you, as soon as you create that environment where it, it is just a job, then they're gonna treat it as just a job. I mean, we, we're all there, we've all been there. We've all had the job. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Well, uh, Robbie, thank you for doing this again. And, um, What engages the audience? Characters. Characters engage the audience. Everyone in this room recognizes these characters. All of them were created for animation. Okay, so they didn't come from books or comics or toys or anything else. They were all created for animation and everybody knows who they are. If I take this thing out to Queen Street and I start showing this to people walking down the street, they're all going to know who those characters are. Everybody's going to know. Um, this is Chris Melodondri, producer of Ice Age and the Despicable Me movies. He says, we start with strong characters and build a movie from there. So I'm going to show you some stills from animated shorts that won the Oscar since the year 2000. So these are not obscure films. These are films that won the Oscar since the year 2000. Don't say anything. Just mentally click off how many of these you recognize. I'm going to show you four, okay? How many people, by a show of hands, recognized all four of those films? Nobody, okay? These films won the Oscar, okay? And they're in your field. They're in animation. And it's since 2000, so it's not like it's ancient history, okay? And nobody here knows all four of those films. How many people know three of those films? Okay, it's like, like four or five people. How many recognize two of those films? Okay, more. All right, so the point is everybody recognized those characters, and you who are in the field couldn't recognize what those films were. Okay, and just for the record, okay, that's um, Father and Daughter, that's The Moon and the Sun, um, John Canemaker's film, this is The House of Small Cubes. And this is the lost thing, 
okay, just so you know. Um, but again, no continuing characters, one-off ideas, and you don't know what they are. 